Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Hi, Michelle. All right. Hey, Jyothi. Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. OK, so um, everybody can see this, the PowerPoint, right? It's always a struggle. Like there's not some random window that's showing. I have three windows open right now. So you can imagine like, <laughs> I'm just hoping everything looks good. Okay, perfect. So happy Friday, everyone. So today we're gonna be talking about um, construction and renovation. This is, I'm sure a very, very, very important, you know, topic for all of those of you who are currently experiencing some, experiencing some construction in your healthcare facilities. Um, it's actually really interesting because this week um, I actually went out with, you know, my colleagues that are here and we walked with our safety um, person and we were able to look at some ICRAs and do some assessments. So it was like a perfect week for us to do that because we're talking about um, construction and renovation. All right. So is the slide going? Yes, perfect. Okay, so construction and renovation, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, yes, you asked the um, questions into the question box, like if you want me to read what you're saying, that is where you put it. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so infection prevention and construction. The infection control risk assessment and mitigation process are important entry points for the active participation by the infection preventionist into the design and oversight of healthcare construction and renovation projects to provide input addressing infection risks to patients, healthcare personnel, and visitors. So how many of you have been actively involved in any construction projects at your facilities this year? And not 2021, but 2020, where it was anybody doing any construction? Yes, lots, lots of construction. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, I think because there were so many things that were going on and things that had already been planned ahead of time, um, there's just been, I feel like, a lot of construction recently. And I know one of our sister facilities we were at recently, uh, we we went over there for like a meeting. We're trying to do more work with uh, local, with another local hospital that's part of our system. Uh, they had a lot of construction as well. So definitely, I feel like there's a lot of that happening right now. So it's really important that we get involved in early. We want to be involved in early in the process when it comes to infection prevention um, and control regarding construction because it's a lot easier to provide input, um, you know, during the planning stages of a, of a project than once a project has been completed and then you're coming in and saying, well, actually, this is really not what we would want to see from an infection prevention standpoint. So some key concepts. The um, IP should have access to and knowledge of the most current guidelines for design and construction of healthcare facilities published by the American. American Society for Healthcare Engineering of the American Hospital Association. And IP leadership is essential in the planning, construction, and acceptance phase, phases of healthcare construction and renovation to protect the health and well-being of healthcare professionals, patients, and visitors. So let's go through a little bit of the history um, and the background of this stuff. So uh, the 1996 guidelines for the design and construction of hospital and healthcare facilities introduced the term infection control risk assessment, the ICRA. So this was first introduced in 1996. The FGI guidelines published in 2001 mandated using an ICRA as part of the planning and construction process. So this is when ICRAs get mandated. You gotta start using this. In 2006, the FGI guidelines added the requirement for written infection control risk mitigation recommendations, which is the ICRMR, describing how the transmission of biological contaminants for, from construction zones will be contained and control, controlled. And then, you know, these are, these are um, 
supposed to be renewed right around every four years or so. Um, that's when they're supposed to be published. The most recent ones are from 2018. Uh, but there are still a lot of people who are following the 2014 um, FGI guidelines. So it really just depends on what does your state's, um, you know, accreditation bodies what are they using you know ACA what are they following are they following 2014 2018 um, depending on what state you're in there's okay so when it comes to construction there is there are so many little there are so many little like caveats like you have to you have you have all of these you know regulations and recommendations um, and some of them have been adopted by CMS some of them haven't and then some states have gone above and beyond what <laughs> what has been stated you know what is not mandated but what is just recommended certain states have said okay well even though it's just a recommendation we're going to go ahead and adopt that so it depends that's the answer it depends on what you know state you're living in so with that in mind what i want you to think about when you're taking your cic exam is are they going to want you to get into the weeds of construction and renovation if we know that there is somewhat of a variance on what each state is going to adopt do you think that they're going to want for you to get into the weeds of construction and renovation yes or no Getting lots of no's. Good. So what we want to do with today's presentation is we want to give you a basic understanding of some things that you want to make sure that you know um, your, you know, your your basics, things that you should know about when it comes to construction. All right. So FGI guidelines 2018. The most recent update, 2018, includes three separate publications. You have one for hospitals, one for outpatient facilities, and one for residential health, care, and support facilities. Among the significant changes in the 2018 update are updates to guidance on design features for acoustic and vibration control, changes to the sustainable design section, included um, expanded recommendations for hazardous waste management and tracking resources like water and energy consumption and then this edition also adds an appendix with expanded emergency preparedness and management recommendations all right so the ICRA we all know about ICRAs well you know maybe some maybe some don't uh, I really so when I took my test initially you have to remember I was working at the health department and um uh, I didn't really know what an ICRA was. I didn't understand, fully understand ICRAs. I, I read the chapters and I tried to comprehend the information based on what was being presented in the text. But it wasn't until I, you know, started working at um, at a hospital that I understood, oh, okay, this is what ICRAs are. So um, in the current 2014 and 2018, it depends. I'm not sure which one your specific states are following. We have a lot of people from different parts of the United States and some people who don't even, you know, I have international people listening in. So it even depends on your country, um, what guidelines you may be using. Um, of the FGI guidelines, the ICRA is part of the broader safety risk assessment process. The ICRA should be completed by a construction team involving representatives from infection prevention, safety, engineering, and healthcare professionals who represent areas of the facility that are likely to be affected by the construction. So one of the things I want you to keep in mind just from this alone is you have a multidisciplinary team. You have IP, safety, engineering, and other potential healthcare professionals this should let you know that you have a specific role to play and that you are not expected to absolutely know everything when it comes to construction and renovation it's just not possible we can't know it all i know that people want us to know it all <laughs> but we can't we can't know it all um okay so the ip's role on the icra team so number one you want to assess the needs and risks of the patient population that will be affected by the construction Number two, you want to address the infection prevention needs of the patients and the healthcare personnel that will occupy this space after construction. You want to provide evidence-based guidance on infection prevention procedures to the project design team. So why should we put, you know, why should we make sure that the sink is deep enough? Why should we make sure that the faucet doesn't come right over the drain? Um, why do we want to avoid having, an, a large amount of counter space right next to a sink because we know that leads to you placing a lot of patient materials next to it all of these things are important you know things uh, to know 
there are different uh, parts of construction and renovation. I've, we spoke about waterborne pathogens last week, so that's why I have water on my mind, but there's a lot of other different things that you need to, to know in order to be able to provide recommendations to your construction teams. All right. So additional experts in ventilation, plumbing, specialty materials, and equipment may be necessary depending on the scope of the project. So once again, you are not expected to know everything. You may need experts in other areas of construction to provide you with that guidelines, with those guidelines and those recommendations. For example, we're currently um, in the process of building in a freestanding ED that will be the responsibility of, of uh, you know, my infection prevention team. So one of the things that had to be done is that we had to send, um, and not me specifically, but um, our construction team had to send over all of the plumbing designs and everything to our water management program so that they could, so that company could take a look at, okay, what does the plumbing look like? So it's not just you know, that's something that completely bypassed me. It went directly to the people who are in charge of our water management program, which is Phygenics. And, you know, different different hospitals use different people. But that is an example of additional experts. All right, so let's use let's do a concept check. The ICRA should influence the facility design, the procedures to prevent exposure from construction debris and the selection of equipment and surfacing materials to manage infection risk. Is this true or false? So we have quite a bit of people on the line, not a lot of people participating. True or false, true or false. Okay, so we have the majority of it is true. Okay. <sighs> Sorry, fire drill. Okay, so majority of people said true, which is Correct. Very good. That is true. All right. The IP's role during the ICRA is to be experts in ventilation, plumbing, specialty materials, and equipment, depending on the scope of the project. Is that true or false? Wrongo, that is false. So typically this presentation is done during close to, you know, the the winter holidays and um, The Grinch is one of my favorite movies. Um, but, you know, we just passed that. We just passed, you know, our winter holidays. So, but anyway, great movie, great movie. And uh, yeah, that is incorrect. Please remember that. We don't have to know everything. All right, ICRA design elements. So the ICRA process should begin early in the project planning phase to ensure that plans and drawings accurately incorporate the recommendations of the ICRA team. Making changes late in the design process can be super, super, super expensive and it can actually delay your project. So that's why they are telling you get involved early. The FGI guidelines specify design elements that the ICRA must address. So these are some of the things that they really want you to focus on. And when you're reading this chapter, the way that they do this is, um, the way that they do this is that they have these different sections and then they um, expand on them. So isolation rooms for protective environments and airborne infection isolation rooms. The next one is going to be special heating, air conditioning, or other ventilation needs. You're going to have water and plumbing systems. That's another area of of focus. So the number and types and location of hand washing and disinfection stations, as well as emergency eye wash and shower stations, uh, plumbing system designed to address potential infection risks from waterborne pathogens. And then number four is going to be the selection of surface finishings and furnishing materials for infection prevention isolation rooms and just general areas as well. So true or false, the ICRA is a written plan describing how the release of potentially infectious agents from the construction activities will be controlled.
OK, so we have some trues, we have some false. OK, so this is one where I want you to pay attention to some of the um, the wording that you're going to see, because this is going to be one of those questions where it's do you know your definitions? All right, so this is just a plain definition that's given to you by the APIC text. So the 2006 FGI guidelines added to the requirement for written infection control risk mitigation recommendations, the ICRMR, and I mentioned this briefly on a previous slide. Describing how the transmission of biological contaminants from construction zones will be contained and controlled. So it's going to be your ICRMR. That would be your answer for this one. Um, do ICRAs contain this? Yes, but they also touch on a lot of other things, not just this. All right, so let's dive into isolation rooms. So when, um, like I said, when you read this text, which you should you should be reading, right? You should make sure you're doing your, your assigned readings. So isolations, when determining the number, types, and design of isolation rooms, consider the patient population, mission, and program goals of the facility, experience with communicable diseases, and other available resources within the community. And this is really important. Um, so like I was telling you, we were, um, we're, const we're building a freestanding ED that, um, that our IP team will be responsible for. Well, during the planning phases for this, um, it, so freestanding EDs are required to have at least, well, no, they are only required to have one negative pressure airborne infection isolation room. But we work somewhat near Disney. We, you know, we've had measles exposures, we've had large international populations that would come through this area and so when when all of this planning was going on mind you all of this is happening also in the middle of covid um we were really pushing we were saying no one room is not enough and obviously we wanted more than one we wanted four but in the end all that um the structure could accommodate was two um, but two is still better than one so this is what they're referring to, your assessment. What kind of populations do you serve? Who's coming into your facilities? All of this plays into what you're going to need. So isolation rooms may be an airborne infection isolation room or an AII, um, AIIR, you know, AII, it, it works. It, or a protective environment or a room that provides both um, airborne infection isolation in a protective environment. Rooms designed as a combination of AII and a PE room must also have an anti-room. And they touch on this, so I think it's important for you to remember this. So while combination AII and uh, protective environment rooms are permitted, the ANSI ASHRAE ASHI ventilation standards included in the FGI guidelines does not support designs in which by the isolation room may be converted from an AII room to a PE room by switching the airflows. And this is due to mistakes. People can make errors. This can be changed, et cetera. The position in the standard prohibiting switchable isolation rooms is based on the complexity of pressure relationships and concerns for serious patient and healthcare provider outcomes if errors were to be made in correct room pressurization. All right. Next is our airborne isolation rooms, and airborne isolation was the hot topic of 2020 when it came to um, our COVID-19 response. I remember early on, our first pandemic planning meeting where we had everyone involved was March 5th, and I remember these were some of the like most difficult questions were, how can we make entire units negative pressure? Do we have... HEPA filters, can we get more HEPA filters, how do we, <laughs> it, it was a whole situation. So let's see what they say about construction and renovation. All right, so number, provide a sufficient number of AII rooms in newly designed or major renovated facilities. The FGI guidelines state at least one AII room should be provided in both hospitals and freestanding emergency care facilities. The FGI guidelines do not require AII rooms for long-term care facilities unless it is so determined by the facility during the ICRA. So there we have that. Who knows? Maybe that will change, right? After all of this that we have experienced this past year and that we're experiencing right now, um, maybe these FGI guidelines will be updated to include certain negative pressure room um, requirements for long-term care facilities. It's still too early to tell. We have to wait for those guidelines to be updated, but that could be something, right? 
um, design. All rooms have airflow from the corridor into the patient room where air inside the AII room directly exhausts to the outdoors. And um, this is this is something that I'm sure a lot of you had to explain to your nursing staff when it came to ventilation, HVAC systems, HEPA filters, exhausts. I know I, re I spent time just talking to our engineering department, trying to just be able to fully understand, okay, these air exchanges, right? So we can increase the intake, we can decrease, the, you know, the, all of this stuff that where they are really the experts in this. Your engineers are your experts and they're able to explain all of this information to you so that you are able to put it in, um, not put it, but, but display it and communicate it in a way where staff members will be able to understand it. Um, so, you know, trying to explain to them, okay, well, you know, just because we have a HEPA filter in the room does, does not make the room negative pressure, right? So, there's there's all of these different things that we that we have had to explain to staff so i feel like a lot of us are a lot more comfortable with this information now that we have had to basically learn a ton about it this year um, the AI room design must include a permanently installed device to monitor the required pressure differential between the room and the corridor. And when those pressures um, change and it's no longer negative pressure, the alarms will start to beep. You know, they'll, I'm not sure what kind of sound your alarms have in your specific um, hospitals and facilities, but there's, it's, it's definitely like annoying. <laughs> like you want to make sure you close the door because it's like a, it's this pitch. Um, it's not like a like an IV pump that you can just it, it can kind of hang out in the background and you can you you hear it and you know that you need to go take a look at it, but it's not as like piercing as these little alarms that they put in the negative pressure rooms and it makes perfect sense why they do that. All right, air recirculation in AII rooms. Air recirculation from the AII room to the general ventilation system or through a dedicated air, air handler unit in the AII room is not permitted in new construction. We have some exceptions, which are the following. One, all rooms that are retrofitted from a standard patient room, and then two, where it is impractical to exhaust the air outdoors. In this situation, recirculation of room air is permitted provided the air first passes through a HEPA filter in addition to the ventilation requirements. AII rooms must meet the basic patient room requirements. All right, so let's talk about protective environments. So your number, how many protective environment rooms do we need to have in the facility? So the ICRA determines the number of PE rooms that are required. When the ICRA determines that one or more PE rooms are required, the FGI guidelines specify that at least one protective environment, rooms, protective environment room must be a combination of an airborne infection isolation room and protective environment room for highly immunosuppressed patients who may have a concurrent infection, such as a cancer patient with varicella, um, et cetera. There could be other scenarios that, that they could fall into. So the design, the protective environment room must be positively pressurized relative to the corridor and adjacent spaces and must include a permanently installed device to monitor the required pressure differential between the room and the corridor. A combination AII PE room must include an ante room in the design. So there must be two devices, one to measure the pressure differential between the room and the ante room, and then another one to measure the pressure between the ante room and the corridor, okay? Now, I don't recall getting any specific questions about um, that, that specific thing, a protective environment room and an AII room, but you may. You may in your test. Remember, all these tests are different. They have different versions. They'll ask you different questions. The FGI guidelines and hand hygiene stations. Hand hygiene, so important. Um, so the FGI guidelines define a hand washing station as a sink with a faucet operated without the use of hands, a source dispenser for cleansing agents, and a method to dry the hands. So a lot of them, you know, you use wrist blades to turn your um, to turn your faucets on and off. Uh, for some locations, the hand washing station faucet can be controlled by a single lever, lever or wrist blades. At other locations, such as scrub stations and multi-bed patient rooms, the hand washing station operation must be hands-free and single lever or wrist blade controls are not permitted. 
All right, hand washing station design should consider materials and installation to ensure ease and effectiveness of cleaning and disinfection, as well as water pressure regulation, faucet placement, and sink design to control splashing. So another thing that they really dive into when it comes to your um, sinks that they talk about in the book is laminated sinks. So laminated sinks are really common, um, but they can, end up with water damage to the core of the material. So that's one of the things that you need to consider when it comes to what type of, um, you know, material material you're gonna install near your sinks. All right, so the FDI guidelines specify the types of substrate that can be used for laminate counters with hand washing sinks and sink counters made from porcelain, stainless steel, or um, solid surfaces materials do not suffer from delaminating due to water damage. So those are some things that you have to take into consideration. Um, your materials, what are you gonna use? They may ask you questions. What should we use? Do you think this is a good material to use? Um, and it's okay to say, I am not sure, let me get back to you on this. That's one of the things that I really try to stress. Um, you should not feel pressured to give responses right away to some concern or something that's being brought up if you do not know that the recommendation or the question that you're about to answer is coming with, you know, that it is an evidence-based recommendation. If you need time to look into something, if you need to pull your APIC text out and read about something, that's perfectly fine. And it is the preferred thing to do than to, um, you know, answer without being sure. That's one of our biggest things being infection preventionists is we want to really be sure that our credibility and that the information that we're providing to our units, our managers, our leaders in our facility is accurate. All right, so FGI guidelines and wall surfaces. So the FGI guidelines require all walls in healthcare facilities to be washable and require those near plumbing fixtures to be scrubbable and resistant to water damage. Invasive procedure rooms, isolation rooms, and sterile processing areas require a smooth finish free of fissures, open joints, and crevices that could retain or permit passage of dirt particles. Vinyl wall coverings are discouraged because they can trap moisture in the wall, creating the potential for fungal growth, especially when located on exterior walls or where plumbing leaks are likely. I have only been in one facility where I've seen the vinyl wall coverings. Um, yeah, it's only been one where I have really seen it and where we were like, yeah, you should get rid of that. Um, another thing to take into consideration, um, you know, when we were talking about sinks and fixtures and walls is what are you going to be using to, to, to dry your hands, um, right? Hot air dryers are permitted under the FDI guidelines, uh, but paper towels are superior to hand dryers. So take that into consideration. All right, so construction risks. This is when we're starting to what what are the risks when it comes to construction? The infection risk from construction work in or near healthcare facility facilities comes primarily from uh, mold spores carried by air movement and waterborne pathogens in plumbing systems that have become stagnant from lack of use during construction. The disruption of accumulated biofilms by the impact of construction work on existing plumbing. And then in addition to these infection risks, there is noise, vibration, interference with traffic flow, and odors from construction activities that can disturb patients and other building occupants. Um, another thing that you need to watch out for is flooding. So flooding can be caused during construction, right? Um, that's definitely something that can happen. Flooding can happen. So just be prepared for that. Um, and Another thing to keep in mind is they're really talking about disturbing patients and other building occupants. There's times when you're doing construction in units or in areas where they don't ever get um, unoccupied. Like if it's a unit that's running 24/7, it's not you know it's not like a clinic where you work from eight to five and then you get to go home and construction workers can come in overnight and do some work to really prevent the disruption. Those are some things to keep in mind. Okay, so construction containment barriers. This is a nice barrier here. So construction work zones in healthcare facilities are often enclosed within a barrier system to contain the dust generated as well as potentially infectious organisms. 
these barriers may be constructed of flexible plastic sheeting, rigid plastic, drywall, or other materials. Um, so this is an example of one of our nicer barriers. They're a bit more expensive, more pricey, more pricey, a bit more bougie. And then this one is just a picture of one of our um, of our plastic barriers. So this is me and my colleague Charles. We were out at one of our um, our, at our sister facility, just kind of touring the place, looking at some of their construction and their units. And so as you can see here, you have that plastic kind of, <laughs> kind of, um, you know, going in. So we know that, that that air from that hallway is being sucked in. We have that negative pressure. It's being filtered out through a HEPA filter. Um, and then if you look above his hat, and to the left, you see all of these papers. Well, these papers contain more information about that project. They're going to have your ICRA paperwork. They're going to have um, uh, project specifications, um, checkoffs that they have to um, sign off on a couple times per day. So there's there's a lot of paperwork that's involved with the sites, and those are some of the things that you would take a look at while you're touring. Well, not touring, but like, you know, when you're doing your audits. I was touring that day, so that's why I said touring, but you know, when you're out there auditing your facility. Okay, so negative pressure with portable air scrubbers located within the containment zone. So this is basically a picture, um, uh, and as you can see, this is a much nicer barrier than I was showing in the previous picture, um, but you have your HEPA filter in, in, your, um, in your zone that is filtering out a lot of that, um, a lot of that, you know, dirt, dust, it's going through there, doing its thing, um, working its magic, and then being sent back out into the corridor. So this is what the text has to say about this. Creating a lower or negative pressure within the contained work zone helps to prevent the release of airborne infectious agents in the event of a breach in the containment barrier or when doors are opened to move workers and equipment in or out of the work zone. This negative pressure is created by exhausting air from the contained workspace. If the air is exhausted to the outdoors away from pedestrian traffic and air intakes, all that may be needed is an exhaust fan to pull the air out of the contained work zone. If the air will be exhausted back into the building or outdoors near an intake or pedestrian traffic, it must first pass through a HEPA filter. And that is that HEPA filter that we have here. You know, it's real cute with it, the little red arrows showing you the contaminated air that's going in and then the HEPA filtered air that's going out. So HEPA filters, let's talk about them. Um, so while I was out on my tour this week or on my audit this week with our safety person here on our campus, um, he started teaching me a bit more about HEPA filters um, and he was talking to me about pre-filters and some of the things that he looks for and it was really interesting. So let's talk about um, our pre-filters. So maintenance costs associated with HEPA filters are high compared with other types of filters, but use of inline disposable free filters can increase the life of a HEPA filter by approximately 25%. Alternatively, if a disposable pre-filter is followed by a filter that is 90% efficient, the life, of, the life of the HEPA filter can be extended ninefold. This concept, called progressive filtration, allows HEPA filters in special care areas to be used for 10 years. So this concept of progressive filtering. So one thing that you have to keep in mind um, is that there are times during a construction project when you are going to want to make sure that these pre-filters are getting changed more frequently. Um, so for example, um, if you are doing a lot of sanding, right, you're doing a lot of sanding, anything that's going to um, be a dust generating activity during construction, um, there's going to be a lot more particles, dust that are going to be getting sucked into that HEPA filter. And the problem is that if that pre-filter gets um, basically, the best way I can explain it is if that if that dust and all of that stuff cakes on there to a point where it's no longer able to suction to bring in that air through through the main HEPA filter, it can actually cause like kind of sort of cracks or or for that filter to cave in a little bit so that the air starts to go in through the sides of the filter rather than passing through the pre-filter. Does that make sense? 
So that's one thing to look at while you're doing your audits and while you're looking at your sites. What does the pre-filter look like? What is the condition of the pre-filter? If this sounds bananas to you and you're just like, um, I don't even know what the pre-filter is. I don't know where, where it's at. How do I find her? Um, where is she located? Contact your safety person. Talk to engineering. I'm telling you the best way for you to make this information stick is not only to read this text, but to actually go out there, learn from people who know more than you, right? You have to be a sponge, all right? To work in infection prevention, you need to be a sponge. You need to be absorbing information all the time. Um, all right, so I got 99 problems and dust is one always. <sighs> dust. Oh, dust. I'm allergic to dust mites. I don't know if I've ever told you guys that, but um, this is literally like a personal t statement. Um, I really do have 99 problems and dust is one of them. So workers should clean. Um, oh, Linda, you're allergic to dust mites too? I'm telling you, these dust mites are out here. Just, it's ridiculous. Okay, good. Okay, good. I have somebody, I have a friend on the line who understands this struggle. All right, so workers should clean loose dust and any possible infectious agents that may be mixed in with the dust from their clothes and tools before leaving the contained workspace. Workers can put on shoe covers before leaving the contained work zone to control dust. Tacky mats. Oh, these are so fun. Tacky mats are fun. Tacky mats can be placed at the exit from the contained workspace and promptly changed out when soiled and can help to remove dust from shoes and wheels on equipment leaving the contained work zone. And so with your tacky mats, they actually have a little tab at the top. And, and let's say you were walking through a construction site and you saw that, oh, this tacky mat is actually not tacky at all. It's pretty, um, it's pretty much full, you're able to just pull that little thing and then you'll have a brand new tacky mat right underneath. Okay, a trash chute is preferred for removing debris from the contained work zone without having to transport it through the facility, but please know that that's not always possible. All right, uh, track, uh, trash chutes are not always possible, so there are going to be times when um, your construction um, colleagues are gonna have to uh, carry carts through the facility. And that's when you wanna make sure that all of your carts are properly covered and that they don't take any shortcuts and forget to like cut things down so that they um, fit into the thing. You know, sometimes they'll, they'll not cut materials down to where they can fit into the cart. So you'll have things sticking out of the cart. They shouldn't do that. <laughs> Um, when a chute is not possible, debris may be removed using carts. Carts must be covered tightly and the exterior clean before leaving the containment zone. And then another thing to keep in mind is that transport through the healthcare facility should occur during the lowest activity period um, using the agreed upon route as part of traffic flow planning during the ICRA process. This is another reason why you want to make sure that you're involved during that planning stage um, because sometimes you know, to for for construction staff, it may seem a lot easier, like, oh, I wouldn't have to open this or I wouldn't have to do that um, if I could just come in through this main part of the lobby area or this main part of whatever type of department. And while that may be easier for them, you may have a higher risk of, you know, exposing patients or healthcare staff to dust and particles. That's that's an example of one of the, the recommendations that I've had to make. Um, well, I would I would actually prefer for it for the entry point to not be here, but to be over here um, to the site. So again, get involved early. All right, so let's talk about our IP and contractor relationship. It is not the IP's job to tell a contractor how to do the work. The IP's job is to verify that the work is conducted in a manner that adequately controls the risk of potential infections and complies with the ICRMRs. All right, telling the contractor how to do his or her work can result in project problems with schedules, costs, and liability. And most of the time when you're going to have to give feedback to a contractor, it may not be IP doing it directly. It may be a discussion that you have with safety and then they make that phone call. Um, because most of the time, it may be you, it may be you, depending on the facility that you're at, but I can tell you it's not me specifically here. Conducting periodic interdisciplinary rounds of the construction sites with the project manager, along with safety, security, and contractor representatives is a good way for the IP to validate compliance with the ICRMRs and ensure any problems get corrected when found. Like I told you, this week I went out with safety. So um, we didn't have everybody else that's mentioned in this uh, bullet point, but 
that's something that you can do. Um, you can maybe say, hey guys, I would like for us to start implementing, uh, for us to do multidisciplinary rounds once a month, or, um, I mean, you should be looking at these things weekly, all the, all of the time really, um, as you're passing them by, depending on which area of the hospital it's happening at. But it's good to just schedule in that extra time to, to um, spend with other departments as well. Okay, air sampling. How are we doing with time? Oh my goodness. Oh, time flies by. Okay, I have to speed up a little bit. Okay, so air sampling. The CDC does not recommend sampling for airborne microbial contaminants before, during, or after construction projects. The CDC does recommend active surveillance to monitor for airborne infections in immunocompromised patients and to periodically review laboratory results and postmortem data to identify additional cases of airborne infections that could be related to construction activities. The most significant technical limitation of air sampling for airborne fungal agents is the lack of standards linking fungal spore levels with infection rates. There's lots of different types of air sampling methods and um, you can learn a lot more about this. Watch some YouTube videos. Um, I've actually seen air sampling one time in pharmacy. It was really cool. Um, so yes, never have done it myself, but it's it's a cool thing to learn about. So sedimentation methods, um, using settle plates and volumetric sampling methods, using a solid impactors, which are commonly employed when sampling air for bacteria and fungi. Settle plates have been used by numerous investigators to detect airborne bacteria or to measure air quality during medical procedures. The use of a slit or sieve impactor samples, samplers capable of collecting large volumes of air in short periods of time are needed to detect low numbers of fungal spores in highly filtered areas. So settle plates, because they rely on gravity during sampling, tend to select for larger particles and lack sensitivity for, um, uh, for respiratory particles, especially in high filtered environments. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some questions. Question one, a hospital is beginning a major construction project. The IP has been asked to join the planning team to assist with the development of the ICRA for the project. What is the purpose of the ICRA? A, to develop and oversee the construction project schedule, B, minimize infectious hazards for patients and healthcare personnel, C, provide direction for level three and four projects only, and then D, coordinate system startups. This one should be pretty easy. It should have just like jumped right out, right on your face. Okay, very good, very good. It did. Good. Minimize infectious hazards, infectious hazards for patients and healthcare personnel. Um, we're going to move on. Question two, a healthcare facility is undergoing extensive renovation. Surveillance for which of the following organisms would be particularly important during any construction or renovation project in a healthcare facility? A, MRSA, VRE, and other MDROs. B, Legionella and Aspergillus. C, gram-negative bacilli. Or D, Mycobacterium abscessus. Very good, Legionella and Aspergillus. We know that we're concerned. We're concerned with dust particles that could be contaminated with bacteria and fungi, which are dispersed and pose a health risk for patients, staff, and visitors. Construction-related HAIs are primarily caused by fungi and to a lesser extent by bacteria. The most common etiological agent is Aspergillus, in particular, A. fumigatus, A. flavus, A. niger, and A. terius. Mm. A. fumigatus is considered the most pathogenic species and is responsible for more than 90% of all Aspergillus infections. Exciting times. Um, and there we have our cute little Aspergillus. Looks like a little, um, what are those things called? The, um, is it a dandelion? The ones with the little frizzy hairs? I think so. Yeah, all right, good job, Mona. She said it's a dandelion. It looks like one. Um, you can't tell me otherwise, it is what it is. And then we have our other friend, Legionella pneumophila down here, which is the most common group of bacteria associated with construction-related HAIs. 
OK, question three. Poor planning during a construction project can lead to an increased risk of infection related to one construction delays, two compromised air quality, three contaminated water, four increase in construction related traffic. Okay, so this question, most of you got it right, but this is what I want you to keep in mind. All of these things are things, um, <laughs> all of these things are things, all of these answer choices are things that we can be concerned with. But the key thing that you need to remember is infection related. So two of these are infection related and the others are just related to construction in general. Come in, hey. How are you? Good. That's okay, no problem. Um, okay, so there are two of them that are related to um, infection, and that is gonna be two and three, which is gonna be comp compromised air quality and then contaminated water. So remember how we talked about um, dust aspergillus that can contaminate the air during construction projects and then contaminated water such as Legionella pneumophila that can be within our the biofilms in our piping. So um, try really hard not to, um, you know, get confused <laughs> or it's not so much confused. It's it's the way that they present these questions. You have to make sure that you identify what the key thing is that they're asking you, because I can see how you might be um, how you may gravitate towards another answer choice. All right, insufficient planning can lead to compromised air quality and potential for con for continued environmental contamination from fungi such as Aspergillus or water contaminated with water associated microorganisms such as Legionella species during construction or renovation. Renovation. Question four, how are we doing with time? We're doing okay. All right, question four. The IP hears that one of the nursing units in his facility will soon be renovated. After verifying the information, he contacts the newly hired director of design and construction to explain how important it is for the IP to be included in the planning and design of all renovation projects. Which of the following is the most compelling argument? A, the IP supplies necessary maintenance for critical utility systems that deliver ventilation and water to patient care areas. B, the IP provides essential input into preventing hazardous risks to patients, healthcare personnel, and visitors during the design and construction projects. C, the IP will ensure compliance with, vari wait, compliance with various regulatory standards and guideline setting agencies. Or D, the IP is responsible for facilitating the transport and approval for disposal of waste materials. Sorry, I, I muted myself accidentally. Um, my bad guys, okay. Um, so immediately, I know the two that I'm gonna go ahead and cross out. I'm gonna cross out A and D, right? Um, the IP is responsible for facilitating the transport and approval of disposal of waste materials. No, um, the IP supplies necessary maintenance for critical utility systems that deliver ventilation. No, so immediately you should be able to cross out two answers, A and D, out the window. So now you are left with B and C. The IP will ensure compliance with various regulatory standards and guideline setting agencies. Absolutely, we will absolutely do that. Um, but there's a lot of other people who do that. Safety does that as well. So 
what is the correct answer? The correct answer is B. We're going to be able to provide essential input and information um, that will help this project keep people safe. So a key element that IPs bring to the construction and renovation process is creating an environment of care that supports prevention of infection and promotes safety of patients and personnel. All right, question five. And as you can see, some of these construction questions are a bit longer. Um, and I will say that that's a pretty accurate representation of how they may show up on your test. So the IP exits the elevator and finds a major renovation area with non-intact barriers near the operating room and ICUs. Dust and debris are evident in the corridor. A meeting is immediately arranged between the hospital engineering director and the contractor. The IP stresses the following. One, an airtight barrier must be installed from floor to ceiling and taped close with duct tape. Two, all debris hauled out of the renovation area must be in tightly closed containers. Three, all dust tracked outside the area must be removed immediately, either by damp mopping or HEPA filtered vacuum. And four, all ventilation ducts must be blocked within the construction area. Okay, so um, this is where we are with this. So when it comes to construction, right, I can see um, why you might be inclined to think that we shouldn't create airtight barriers and to use duct tape, but that's actually a pretty common practice depending on where you're working um, since duct tape is a little bit more sturdier than some other type of tape, but um, don't don't let that duct tape alone discourage you. The answer, okay, so the key to getting this question correct is you have to be able to pick out the imposter. <laughs> you have to be able to pick out the one that, yeah, I definitely don't want to stress this. And the one that you definitely do not want to stress is number four. All ventilation ducts must be blocked within the construction area. And I am not a ventilation expert, so do not quote me on this, right? But when you're reading the text, they talk to you about, okay, you need to figure out which um, uh, which ducts are you gonna need to block off, what is necessary, and remember in the beginning we talked about IP is not always going to be the expert on these things. This is when you need to talk to your engineering because let me tell you something, when it comes to air exchanges, duct work, all of this stuff, um, I just learned about plume ceilings the other day while I was out there with Eric, our safety person. There is so much that I do not know about this that personally, myself, I would not feel comfortable making this type of a call. Um, the other things, one through three, cool, absolutely. Yes, we need to do all of those things. This fourth one, I don't know if that's the appropriate recommendation. We're, we might need some additional guidance on this one, right? Because that might actually not be the best thing to do. Um, this could mess with your pressures. This could mess with your exhaust. There are there are just so many things um, that that deal with um, like ventilation that may be outside of scope of our scope of practice and our scope of knowledge. If you know all of this stuff, that's fantastic. But I'm going to tell you that the majority of IPs aren't going to come in with this extensive knowledge on HVAC systems. All right, so best practices for preventing HAIs during construction and renovation. Avoid routing construction personnel through the hospital, absolutely. When negative air pressures are required within construction sites, they must be strictly maintained at all times. Contain construction sites through the use of tight barriers or enclosures in order to prevent the circulation of dust. Uh, dust containment carts should be used. HVAC ductwork and systems must be protected so as not to hinder negative air pressurization. So that's also, that's something that you can dive a lot deeper in with engineering and safety. Uh, the construction of anti-rooms where workers may change into protective apparel, shoe covers, and store clean equipment are recommended. And then clean and properly sized walk-off sticky mats must be in use at all site access points. 
So these are the things that we're looking for. Question six, which of the following methods of air sampling is most useful for detecting low numbers of fungal spores in areas that are highly filtered? Sieve impactor samplers, B is swabs of inanimate objects, C is particle counters, and D is settle plates. So this, you're gonna wanna detect low number of fungal spores. So this is gonna be one of the answer choices or the type of question where you're either gonna have a pretty clear idea of what air sampling is and get directly to it, or you're gonna have to make an educated guess. So if you recall, when we were talking about um, air sampling briefly, mind you, briefly, um, we did say settle plates tend to be better for um, larger uh, particles because you're working with gravity. Um, so despite the fact that there are several unresolved issues related to, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you what it was, it was sieve impactor samplers is the correct answer. So despite the fact that there are several unresolved issues related to microbiologic air sampling, it is sometimes used to assess air quality during or after construction projects or to look for a potential microbial source during an outbreak. Sieve impactor samplers are designed to sample large volumes of air in a short period of time. A, a solid or liquid microbial medium is exposed to air that is drawn into the impactor. After the appropriate collection time, the media is removed and incubated to test for bacterial or fungal growth. Sieve impactor samplers are the most appreciate sampling method to detect low numbers of fungal spores in a highly filtered area because of the large volume of air that is sampled, okay? So this is, this one, your air sampling, you just gotta read. You have to read more about it, watch some videos on what it looks like. It'll help it make sense. Question seven, which of the following is the most important focus of an infection control program during construction and repairs within a healthcare facility? A, staying with the proposed time frame of the project. B minimizing noise, C, keeping costs low, or D, reducing dust? I'm literally gonna give you like three seconds. Absolutely, good job. We wanna reduce dust. That is the thing that we're looking to do. Question eight. Of the CDC recommendations for air handling systems in healthcare facilities, which of the following is the most highly compared to other choices? <laughs> Lord. Okay, so A, do not use areas with through the wall ventilation units as protective environment rooms. B, incorporate steam humidifiers if possible to reduce potential for microbial proliferation within the system and avoid use of cool mist humidifiers. C, Remove bird roosts and nests near air intake to prevent mites and fungal spores from entering the ventilation system. And D, conduct an infection control risk assessment and provide an adequate number of AII and PE rooms to meet the needs of patient population. Okay, so the way to kind of tackle this question is, um, first things is there are these guidelines, the Guidelines for Environmental Infection Control in Healthcare Facilities that were published in 2003, and um, there were some updates in July of 2019 to this document. Um, but which one of these does it seem to be the one that we would be most highly to recommend? And the correct answer is D. That's that's what this entire chapter has been about. Um, also, it's important to keep in mind that the way that um, these recommendations are basically given through CDC is that they have different categories depending on how strong the evidence is to provide that recommendation, right? And um, yeah, okay. Heating and ventilation and air conditioning. Um, so it's three o'clock. I know some of you may have to hop off and that's absolutely fine. We have just um, a couple more questions. I think three more questions and then we'll be done. So those of you who wanna stay on, just stay on. And if you have to you know, hop off, that's fine. Have a wonderful weekend. Um, but let's go ahead and do our heating, ventilation and air conditioning questions. So question one, 
An outbreak of aspergillosis is suspected after several oncology patients are identified with positive cultures. The IP suspects a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning malfunction and begins an outbreak investigation. The IP has been asked to make recommendations for environmental cultures. All of the following needs to be considered except a identifying the purpose of culturing and appropriate methods beforehand b meeting with the facility legal staff to discuss notification of the patients c anticipating decisions and planned actions to results of culturing before undertaking the process and d determining whether there are existing standards to interpret results Very good, very good. So the majority <laughs> would be um, B, meeting with the facility legal staff to discuss notification of the patients. So this is something that obviously needs to be discussed. Now, is it something that IP is going to be pulled into directly? We may be asked questions about it, um, but this is something that legal is gonna work out more with you know, your patient safety department, and they're gonna have discussions with people um, that are a bit higher in the food chain. Um, when an outbreak is identified or suspected, an environmental source may be present and confirmatory testing is appropriate. A critical review of the indications for airborne particulate monitoring or cultures must be done in light of basic principles of outbreak investigation. One can also consider the following. The purpose of culturing and appropriate methods that should be identified beforehand. Decisions and planned actions regarding results of culturing should be anticipated before undertaking the process. And the determination should be made whether there are existing standards to interpret those results. All right, next question, question two. All of the following may be indications of a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning malfunction except A, an increase in the post-operative surgical site infection rates. B, a single case of aspergillosis in a severely immunosuppressed patient. C, healthcare-associated varicella infections. Or D, an outbreak of ventilator-associated acinetobacter infections in the intensive care unit. <clears throat> okay, two more seconds here. All right, so with this question, again, the key to answering this question right is which one of these answer choices is the imposter, right? Because it's saying all of the following can be indications of HBAC malfunctions or failures, except one of them. And the correct answer is going to be an outbreak of ventilator-associated acinetobacter infections in the intensive care unit. All of these other things could point towards um, us having issues with our HVAC system, but in an outbreak of acinetobacter related um, to our uh, to our ventilators in an intensive care unit really points to um, some more common um, outbreak reasons. You know, contact lack of hand hygiene. Um, it, it could be potentially some other type of um, uh, product that we could be using. Um, I know that you guys saw Burkholderia was found in, um, you know, chlorhexidine mouthwash, right? So detection and identification of certain HAIs may suggest HVAC malfunctions. Um, Analysis of post-operative SSI rates and associated infections agents may offer important clues to problems in the OR systems. HVAC systems are not usually the immediate cause of a device-associated HAI. Okay, so I think we've covered everything. That's it for today. Um, we went a bit over, let me see, about six minutes over, not too bad. Um, I hope this was helpful. So we're almost done with the group. Um, we are almost, almost done. We're like, it's almost over. I'm sure you guys are excited um, for it to end. For our, you guys are probably like, oh, 
another Friday meeting. I can't do it anymore. Um, but thank you for, you know, listening in. I hope that you guys have a wonderful weekend. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and type it in right now. Um, I don't have access to my my Department of Health email right now. You guys know that this is a constant struggle where I get kicked off and then I have to call and get back on it's this whole situation. Um, so I do apologize because um, I have to basically get access to it again. It's a whole situation. Uh, but when does the next group start? That's a great question and I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I have to talk to the HAI program manager for Florida um, and kind of talk about what the plan for this next year is. Um, you know, I will be meeting with her um, probably in February, so I'll have some answers then. Anything else? That's the only one. Uh, how do we review the past presentations? You gotta go on um, our Google Drive. You gotta go on the Google Drive. Any good resource for MPH certification? I'm not sure if I understand that. Are you talking about the CPH or uh, CIC or the CPH? Um, I'm an auditory learner, so I listen to a lot of the YouTube videos that got you prepared for the CPH. Is this the last meeting? No, this is not the last meeting. You cannot leave just yet. <laughs> we have a couple more. I think it's two or three more. Um, so we're almost done. We'll be done in February. All right, guys, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Have a happy Friday. Thank you everybody for listening in and I will see you guys next week.